Welcome, everybody, to Let's Talk About It. I'm your host, Ramona Yandris, and I'm so glad you're with us today. I was enjoying that song that Mark wrote, one of his newer ones, Exalt, His Name Above the Heavens. Uh, I was on there, and my foster son was on there. Well, he's legal guardian now. But um, I love the energy that, of the songs that he produces, and I love the lyrics of the songs, and, and um, it's always so worshipful and just so energizing. So we've been in here um, bebopping a bit to the music. Well, I want to talk to you today about leadership. Um, I've had a lot of different leaders over me, and some of them are textbook leaders, some of them um, need to be written out of the textbook as leaders. Uh, but, you know, I, I always thought, you know, I hear so many people saying they want to be a leader. Well, the thing you need to do if you're trying to lead people is turn around, and this is a key, turn around and see who's following. And that will determine whether or not you have leadership skills. You've got... You've got to lead, not drive. And, um, and I, will, I think good leadership has always caused a great and a remarkable outcome. There are many so-called spiritual leaders who rise up in their ranks, yet they rule in this day and age and lead with a wrong outlook and a spirit, thinking more of themselves than they should. So hear me out before you judge. But when they do lead in righteousness, then the miraculous happens. I have had some of the best leaders that, that could lead a service and could lead in their life and lead in their ministry and lead in their marriage and lead in, in their counseling. And you could tell they were God-ordained for the job that they had. And it's very important not to just desire leadership because it looks like it's all of that. But you have to know that in leadership, you have to be called to lead the people of God. And in this day and age when ministry in the pulpit looks so glamorous and so enticing, when crowds follow speakers to the conference just to hear a sermon, then we raise up a generation of just glorified speakers we're not really raising up always leadership. And if that same speaker then builds a church, he rolls up his sleeves and he puts his shoulder to the wheel, which you normally see in a lot of churches, and outreaches his own community. They tend their own flock and tire tirelessly, prays for the sick, gives to the poor, lifts a hand to the down and out, and builds faith and instills the word of God into people and into his congregation and actually leads. Then he raises up ministers in his own congregation and workers in the harvest under him who also replicate his work. So what you do as a leadership is what your, your people that you're raising up will do. They'll, they'll rise even above you when you give them the right tools and the right example we learn so much from each leader. There's always a takeaway. I have a takeaway from the good and I have a takeaway from the bad, but I learn something from every leader, no matter what. Some are called to evangelize. Some are called to be apostles. Some are called to pastor. Some are called as prophets. Some are called to teach. Then there are secondary leaders, those who are called to help. And I, for the life of me, don't understand why we don't strive to be help in a church, the ministry of help. Someone who feels great supporting the ministry that they were called into as essential in upholding the arms of God's man. You look at Elijah and you look at Elisha. Thank God for Elisha. You look at Aaron and you look at Moses. Thank God for Aaron. There's, there's, there's so much in those ministries that could not have been done without the one who was there to help and support. And we, we should give as much honor to them because they allowed the man who was the spokesman for God to do the work that they were set to do. 
They loved, they loved uh, him for what he was and are loyal to the cause, and they seek nothing in return when you're in the helps ministry. This is a rare gem that you can find in, in a secondary leader as most only one advancement in the ultimate spotlight. Although most are called to advance further, it is refreshing and a blessing to see someone understand and walk in this secondary leadership role hand in hand with God's appointed leader. Sadly, in this day, we rely on a vote for a man. Most times it's necessary. And we have gotten away from the man who was so in tune with the Lord that he could say with conviction that God has called me here. God has called me to this field of labor, and the anointing is on him to lead the flock and to take it in, in, in areas that they never dreamed possible, and then wade through many adversities until a monument for Christ is built in, to the glory of God in that town and win the lost. My proverbial hat is off to church builders who work it from the ground up. It's not an easy road. We have many in our, in our times right now that are starting churches all across this nation and into the other regions of the world. May God bless them because that is not an easy road. It's difficult. They literally give up everything for the kingdom of God. The next man who comes in after him steps into that labor and he reaps the rewards that the man who built it didn't reap. It doesn't seem fair, right? But it is because you have started a legacy for God and God will take it to a greater level than you could even dream. So to think what stories that certain leaders in the Bible left us with uh, that are revealed like in the traits of character, strength and honor, dishonor, compassion, true love, dishonest, loyal, disloyal, offended, cruel, harsh, gentle, anointed, prayerful, righteous, lovers of God more than lovers of self, steadfast. And I ask myself, how do so many of these obvious human flaws get used by God? Have you ever wondered that? See, we humans think you, we don't include ourselves in that exclusion, have to be perfect before we can be used. That's not so. There is none perfect among us. There are so many places God can use us all. We just have to first know and always remind ourselves that kingdom first should always be our motto. I heard uh, Jason Crabb sing a new song. Well, it's actually not, it was written years ago by his friend who finally gave him the rights to the song, but it was called God Can Use a Broken Man. You don't have to be perfect to be used by God. There are some that try um, hard to make you perfect, but perfection comes out of mistakes that you make and you overcome and you go on and allow God to perfect you and, and prayer to perfect you and the word of God to perfect you. And then God anoints you and appoints you. You just have to go through that process. My dad was a gang leader before he was a preacher. He was a broken man, but God can use a broken man. If someone sings better than you, don't attack them and, and use jealous tactics to get the part you crave. Be a team, a, a, a team member in ministry. Allow God to use others among you. Be the first to give up your seat at the piano, at the organ, at the bass, at the guitar, at the drums, at the bongos, the tambourine, etc. Whatever it is, if someone can play more skillfully, allow them to do that. We want to have our best to be used before God. Does, does it always require the best? No, but use the best you do have, and God will anoint that. I mean, when my brother-in-law, Mark Andrus, walks into any place I'm at, I give up my seat immediately. The man, he's a genius. He is um, literally a genius in music, and, and I honor that in him, and I want God to be able to use someone like that because they can reach the masses that we cannot reach, right? So he can literally use 
anybody. It just takes a willing and an anointed vessel. So in each leadership that we have in churches, you might recognize some of the leaders I'm going to talk about. It's going to be fun. We're going to take this somewhere. Um, And I want you to see maybe where you feel like you fit in when you recognize the reference. Let's also not be so quick to point out fingers at the reference of others. Like, you know, someone talks about something from the pulpit that others are doing. You feel like just taking a shovel and hitting it back there because you don't want it to hit you. But sometimes it has to hit you. Um, There are always at least a few fingers pointing back at ourselves. So that can be a little humbling. So here it goes. Let's talk about the Elijah leader. You go to 1 Kings 18 and 22, you'll see that some are like Elijah. They operate in hopelessness. They think they are doing it all alone. They whine and they gripe that they're alone. They simply do not know how to delegate and use others. Sometimes God has to remind them that he has many more doing the same thing. You remember when his eyes were open, when God said, I got a whole lot more than you out there doing what you're doing. You don't know that because you only see what's right here in front of your eyes. But God's got so many out there. We are not doing this alone. We need to use each other to advance, not our kingdom, but rather God's kingdom. Then we have the Jezebel wannabe leader. Jezebel. Well, this spirit wants to control everything and everyone. It can be male or female. Every spirit of control in the church that does not line up with the pulpit, the man of God and God's word is out of order. You are an accident waiting to happen. You cannot muzzle the ox. You cannot insert your control over the man of God in the departments of the church. God will see to it that you and your household will come to ruin if you don't make it right. You simply have the wrong spirit and outlook on God's man and his work. If you don't love the man of God, which is your pastor, then how can you say you love God? Don't worry through pastor God's got this. You just got to keep on working for the kingdom. The Jezebels are going to fall by the wayside and the church is going to roll right on. Amen. You've all seen it happen. I know your, your curiosity is uh, peaking right now. Now let's talk about the Jonah leader. Jonah leaders run from responsibilities. Have you ever seen a leader like that? Oh, how easy this temptation is for humanity. Like the saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. In this day of ease, most don't stick it out. They crash and they burn at the first sight of trouble. They leave the minute there's a little bit of stirring going on in the church and they don't feel like they can handle it. Their blinders have been removed and they get overwhelmed at the very thought of the work set before them. They forget that God promised promised that his grace was sufficient for every need. He gives us sometimes, as a song used to say, just enough to take me through one more mile, just enough to dry my eyes a little while. When I get home, I won't need it. But as I travel this weary land, he always gives me just enough grace to stand. So if God has called you into a difficult ministry or position, stay the course. Don't quit or defect every time you think someone's talking about you or you have adversity. If God's called you to it, he's going to bring you through it. Stay the course and quit being a quitter. Amen. So now, let's talk about the Moses leader. Moses, well, he let anger lead, didn't he? Strike the rock in anger. Then he got shut out of Canaan land for doing that. So many events happen in our lives as ministry, and it brings us to anger. Yet the scripture says, let he who rules well be worthy of double honor. I hope you have pastors in your church that rule well and that you give them double honor. I mean, if, if um, I heard 
one man years ago preaching this, and he talked about if you normally bake a pie for your family, well, bake your pastor two pies. Well, you might not want to do that if you don't want a fat pastor, so just maybe make him one pie. The decisions a pastor makes has to be from a clear head. We may have our own personal opinions about someone, but remember the person you are angry at is still a child of God. And your outburst of anger can not only cause defeat in your flock, but also can keep you from where God actually intended for you to attain to in your own promised land. If people disappoint us and walk away, let them go. Let them go. Not everybody fits our unique circle or within the personality of a church. Don't assault them with unkind or angry words. It doesn't mean you have to have contact. In fact, it's best not to. What's the point? It keeps your anger and bitterness at bay and allow people to go and flourish elsewhere. God it always sends a replacement, usually sooner than later, and who will be faithful. Just be kind to everybody, whether they come and whether they go. Receive them with kindness and let them exit with kindness, and God will bless you and will bless your congregation. Then we have the Saul leader. Wow. Saul, he tried to destroy other anointed leaders. This is a, one of the most commonly used tactics among ministry today. If someone is offended at you for any reason, the petty flesh tries to tear down a person's reputation. I mean, I, I've heard of preachers, if, if they didn't like if someone left and went and started a church and God was blessing that they would call the leaders and try to get them to not be licensed. But who are we to stop a messenger from the Lord? Who are we to stop ministries from flourishing? Let them go. Because I found if you let them go and you treat them with kindness, normally they come back. So that's a good point right there. If you will quit coming around, then they can remain the king of the roost. Well, this type of man or woman is definitely not kingdom-minded and seek only to elevate themselves. They also promote their flock to honor only them and have preacher worship mentality. Thank God. Thank God. We don't see that a whole lot, but yet you can see it. A premier flock and a tribute to the former pastor is one that stays and is loyal to the kingdom in spite of anything. Love and honor your pastor. This is biblical, but don't have preacher worship. Have God worship. He shares his glory with no one. We are all here to serve. And we have to keep that in mind anytime that we become leaders over God's flock. Is This is not our church. It's God's church. Now I have an interesting one to talk to you about, and that is the Judas leader. Well, Judas, we know his outcome. He was untrustworthy. He revealed secrets to wound others to gain power. He will sell you out for an advancement or validation. He will sell you out for anything if he thinks he can get a grip on being somebody. This takes the life out of so many of us. It is a trick of the enemy to cause offense. Yet in the end, the person you are really hurting is just yourself. God will fight the battle of those wronged. He keeps excellent records and you will be judged by your words and your deeds. So keep your tongue in check. If you are a friend to the ministry, be confidential. You are there to support, not to tear down. If you are a minister and friends with another minister and you have information that tears down the other person, don't go sell those secrets to the highest bidder. Shut your mouth and pray for your friend. Go to them regarding the, regardless of the error of their ways. Only then have you done what the scripture says for you to do. Just for the record, the scripture does say, to mark them that cause division among you and to avoid them. No 
where does it say if a brother or sister are in error or taken in a fault to mark them and avoid them? I see it so many times where men fail, women fail, and we want to shame them publicly. We want to shame them ministerially. Um, we want to shame them in front of those who know nothing about this person. Yet we are, we are told in the scriptures to go and bring them back to the Lord, bring them back to where they need to be. I don't know what God has for them in the future. I'm not God. And so we shouldn't have that mentality. We should restore them back to the Lord if they need restoration. It just might mean that they were treated so unjustly and unscripturally that in their mind they had no way out, and they felt the only way to survive is to leave God altogether. Aren't we tired of the exit? It's not all standards that folks leave over. Sometimes it's a lot of simply offense gone wrong. We got to be careful on how we treat others. I remember my dad always saying when I talked back to my mom, you're not treating her like that anymore because that's my wife. And so I learned it wasn't just my mom, it was also his wife. And so you have to learn that in the house of God. These people are not just your local friends, they're also children of the Lord, and you have to treat them accordingly. Well, we have another leader. Let's talk about the Enoch leader. Well, Enoch, he had a prayer life that was unrivaled by none. The ministry friends that I have had in this day and age that greatly affected me are the life of the ministry that had an obvious, powerful prayer life. One in particular was my pastor for a short season, Brother Verbal Bean, you want a demonstration of the Holy Ghost like he had, then you got to pray and have a prayer life like he had. I can name so many men and women of God that became an icon, not because of their gifting, but rather because of their anointing. It was resulting from a prayer life. If you want to be caught up in the heavens like Enoch, then daily walk with God. Don't leave it to the after service prayer. But find your own space, your own room, your own closet. No matter how big you become, keep that prayer life consistent. You don't need to tell anyone that you have a prayer life. While I was in prayer today, God told me, da, 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 da. No, all you got to do is speak the word. Your anointing will show that you have a prayer life. Your actions and your unction will tell on you. That is, the, that is the direct result of a powerful prayer life of a leader. Well, we now have the Esau leader. Who's an Esau leader? Esau will, sh- will sell out cheaply for an easier way. Esau sold his little bowl of soup or portage, whatever it was, just to get what he wanted to get. Don't sell out cheaply. You don't prepare for the task ahead. You don't value what you have been given. You take it for granted. Your decisions are based on fleshly desires. Then yes, you have another Esau on your hands. One who will abandon what God meant for him because he wanted to quickly satisfy his own flesh. These people will sell out to the first person that will give them advancement. Make their life easier and not make them more accountable. This simply speaks for itself. No more words are even needed. Don't be an Esau leader. Well, now we have John the Revelator leader. John the Revelator works even though abandoned and wounded. You didn't know I was going there. Even though you've been abandoned by your friends, and you've been wounded by the things they've said. He tortured for Christ's sake. John the Revelator was sent to die alone. This man of God decided, I'm going to leave a mark in this world for the sake of the kingdom. God trusted him that he gave him visions and placed him in a solitary place where his mind and his writings were solely devoted 
to what God gave him. They, those that put him there, meant it for evil, but God had meant it for good. We would not have the book of Revelations unless John had been sent to the Isle of Patmos and left alone to die. Thank you, John, that you allowed God to use you even in your pain and your suffering, that you would be able to write the book that you wrote. The struggles and the trials that you go through as ministry may not be there to destroy you, but rather to save the lost that are coming up behind you. God has a purpose and he has a plan. If you truly mean for him to use you, don't get upset when things go bad, when you can't see your way, when you can't figure out why, just trust him. We may not understand it until we reach the other side, but you are sold out. You are there to the bitter end. We better toughen up as the end of time comes, as the day approaches. We are all going to be that much more offended, hurt, rejected, wounded, talked about, mistreated, persecuted. But instead of giving up, take up your cross, take up a pen, write encouraging words to yourself and to others, and be strong and faint not for the morning is coming, and those that have remained faithful during their hardest times are the ones that God is going to reward. Oh yes, be like John. I thank God for all these little um, analogies that we're getting from this, and the next one I want to talk about is the Peter leader. Well, I've seen a lot of those in my time, a lot. Because Peter let fear rule his actions. Yes, he was afraid of Jesus going to the cross. That he cut a man's ear off. Yet he was bold enough to do that. He was so afraid of being found out that he was, dis- that he was a disciple that he cursed and he lied to prove that he wasn't of his. He was so afraid that he never showed up at the cross. Wow. When you are so sensitive that when things do not go your way or turn out like you would like them to, when the dream you had is shattered and fear grips you, affecting your words, affecting your actions, your loyalty, all of this was nothing more than a lack of faith. Yet through all of this foolishness, Jesus had great faith in Peter So many times Jesus had to emphasize a point to Peter. Peter, do you love me? I often wondered why this line of questioning until you look at the overall high-low of the passions of Peter. Jesus knew he operated out of his passion. Yes, he did. He had anger and fear fall under that category. Yet emotional people can sometimes be the worst friends and the worst leaders. They always want someone to be loving toward them. They always fear that someone's talking against them and talking about them. Um, Yet, they're not, and it kills the hope and faith every time you you converse with them. They always make you feel like the breath has come out of you, that there's... I don't even know how to help this person. All they do is they're so worried about what everybody else is saying. You exhaust everybody. When you leave, you just feel like a breath of fresh air has finally come into the room. But Jesus knew one thing. If I could just channel, just channel the passion that Peter had in the right way, then there would be no stopping him. And knowing that Peter denied him, knowing that Peter had disassociated himself from him, knowing that Peter was angry, knowing that Peter was offended, knowing that the disciples were offended at Peter. Yet when Jesus arose from the tomb, he left a young man clothed in white with a special message to the disciples and to Peter. He grouped everybody else in one group and to Peter. He knew how offended he would get if he didn't get special attention And God gave it that to him. See, at this point, Peter had angered and offended himself in his own mind right out of the ministry. Yet Jesus knew 
that and and his temperament, and he left an angel to speak to him to make this reference so that the disciples would accept him back. Made special mention to the emotional future powerhouse in Mark 16 and 7 when he said, go and tell the disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. So that was the potential fatal flaw in Peter, anger and fear can destroy a ministry, a marriage, a job. And if you are in any ministry, you must keep your emotions in check. Peter was so overwhelmed at Jesus' tolerance and forgiveness that he was humbled and became a Holy Ghost powerhouse for the kingdom. And that's what we have to do. We have to channel some of the things that look negative into the good so that God can use us for a holy purpose. Then we have John the Beloved. John stayed at the cross even though he could have been arrested. Real leaders walk with you through the fire if you will allow them to. Before Jesus bowed his head and died, he looked at his mother and said of John, Woman, behold your son. He took a look at someone who was sold out and will stay with you even when the odds are stacked against you. He was one of the first to reach the tomb after Jesus arose in John 19, 26 and 27, also in John 20, 1 through 10. He follows Jesus, though the other disciples questioned his involvement in John 21, and was one of the seven fishermen that fished all night when it looked hopeless. Yet his persistence paid off when Jesus showed up Woo! in John 21, 1 through 25. Even though the other disciples cut him out of written involvement, he just kept ministering. No wonder he was the beloved of Jesus. He exemplified more fruit of the Spirit than all of them put together. He was completely Christ-like. Maybe jealousy, jealousy caused him to be shut out. What Brother O'Brien said about my dad years ago was that he had never met anyone more Christ-like than Carl J. Ballestero, and that was the best compliment my dad said he ever received. So whatever style of leadership you are given to, make sure it lines up with advancing the kingdom of God. Don't allow the flesh to rule spiritual things. Please, above all, rule in love. Don't lord over God's heritage. That's a scripture. Nor be a Pharisee. Be humble in spirit and in deed. And let God be glorified in all that we do. If you have no ability to bind people together in love and unity, you may merely have a desire and not a calling. That would be the will of God. May you be blessed by this today. And may you see yourself in one of these leadership roles Follow after God in your ministry and let God perform a perfect work in your life and in the life of the people that you lead. May you be blessed today. Come and visit us here at the Rock Church. We are at 929 Weddell Court in Sunnyvale. Church starts at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, 730 on Wednesday p.m. Come and be a part and may the Lord bless you. Thanks for watching the Rock Church Network. We hope you can like, follow, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. We're going to provide you with more uplifting daily content. We can't wait to connect with you more. Stay connected, stay blessed, and see you in the next video.